you've all should have received communion. If you haven't, just let us know. But I'm going to ask you to be seated because it's very important what we do in the next few moments. This is the regrouping. This is our opportunity to come back to God. All by yourself in your seat, even without the sermon, you can make amends with the Lord. He'll remind you. He'll bring to remembrance those things that ought not to be. Words we've said. Actions. Things we've done. It's here in this moment of an altar all by ourselves, just us and God, where we say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for what I've done. I'm sorry for what I've made it. And with a clear conscience, we come before God again. We regroup around the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. So Jesus gathered his closest disciples at a, a very difficult moment. A moment of his own betrayal. A moment in which most of us would be angered and enraged. He understands the moment clearly. I'm being betrayed and I'm going to go to a cross and I'm going to die but not for my penalty for the penalty of all humanity. In understanding the moment he then has communion with his disciples. And he takes the bread and he says, this is my body which is broken for you. Would you take the bread with me? Heavenly Father, we are in awe of how you bore your back to the Roman soldiers. How you took those stripes and never backed down. Like a sheep led to the slaughter, you said not a word. Though innocent, you took my guilt. You took my shame. You took my sin. And in return, you give us life. I praise you, God, and thank you for it. Afterward, he took the cup. the dividing line of all time, a new covenant in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. No longer to be the offering of bulls and goats, merely covering up sin. No, sin would be washed away once and for all by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. So he encourages his disciples, as I encourage you today, take this in remembrance of him. Jesus Messiah, name above all names, blessed Redeemer. sermon, I need to remind you that we are memorizers of the Word of God. That is, that we have within ourselves an arsenal because we have a very real enemy that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. What do you got? If that's what's coming against us, what do we have in return? We ought to have an arsenal of scriptures 
So month by month, we take the opportunity to give a verse to you to put in your arsenal. And this month, it is Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Then Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are weary and carry heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Do I have any stressed out people? Any overburdened, wearied individuals? We can park there or we can say, all right, God, here's my situation. What do you have? And he looks you in the eye and says, I've got rest. Anybody interested in the rest of Almighty God? And I want to continue in this theme. That's why it's the verse this month. Uh, we are all about action. In fact, our, 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 our word for the year, 2022, is the word propelled. It has within it a sense of action, that we want to move forward in whatever God has for us. And it sounds very exciting. It sounds very invigorating. It sounds very much filled with adrenaline rushes and, God, what do you have next? And I kind of grew up in a church like that. It was very exciting. Uh, we had altar call every Sunday. I saw miracles with my own eyes. I saw people that couldn't walk when they, when they came into service, and they left without uh, their wheelchairs. They left without crutches. I've seen blind eyes open. I've seen disease leave people's bodies. And I thought, I don't want that to be the, the story of yesteryear. Our God is present and alive to do miracles today, and I've longed for that experience again. I don't just have altar because I think we're a bunch of broken people. I have altar because I know it. I know we're a bunch of broken people. I know we've all got issues and problems, and I have met the great physician. I have met the healer. I know what he is capable of, and so I invite you out of a, a system in a world that is just full of problem, stress, and anxiety. And I say, come unto Jesus. He is the one that will give you rest. Now, when you're speaking action and propelled motion of God, the word rest almost seems like the antithesis. I'll give you a further example. Uh, one Saturday, I, I took the family out on a kayak. And we were out there for maybe about 30 minutes, and we parked our kayaks, and we ate a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, and we ate some cherries, and we ate some potato chips, and we drank some water. Isn't that awesome? I mean, that story just, it's not like the other stories I've told you where, you know, that, that yacht pushed us up on our side, and we thought we were going to wreck. It's not like the stories I've told you where a 12-foot alligator is in the river with us, waiting to eat us. I mean, this lacks all sorts of adrenaline rushes. It's just like, you did what? <laughs> you sat on the shore and you ate a sandwich? Big deal. Anybody can eat a sandwich. But it's, it's the crucial time of day when you can predict the wine of your children. Do you understand what I'm saying? When are we going to stop? I'm hungry. I'm tired. I'm thirsty. You know whinies, right? The language of children. And you can see it in their eyes, and they're almost spent, and you pull off, and you put a sandwich in their hand. There's nothing like reading your children and expecting them to whine, and you shove a sandwich in there. <laughs> I got you, kid. I know exactly where you were ready to break, and we took rest. But there are many people that miss the opportunity to take a crucial rest in the tumult of life, and they keep pressing on, and they end up breaking. They are spilled out. They are broken in more ways than one, trying to repair their lives. But if only they would have taken the necessary rest at just the right time before they would break, you would be refreshed and ready to get back into life. Are you with me? And if we're not brave enough, smart enough, strong enough to take the legitimate breaks in our life, the times of rest where God says unto you, 
Come unto me, all you who are heavy laden and overburdened, and I will give you rest. How many of you could use a break? You're at your breaking point. You say, it would be wise of me to pull off. You know, I, I've been on many a road trip with my family, and I thank God for that blue sign that says, rest stop. <laughs> Here it comes. Because, you know, I'm a typical guy. I, I, I look at the starting time and the finishing time of how long my journey could take. It says two hours, but then you have kids in the car. And you've got to figure, all right, it's going to take them a half hour just to go pee. I don't know what they're doing in there. But if you don't calculate that into it, what happens to your two hours? He blew that out of the water, right? So you've got to calculate into the journey, I've got rest. I've got stops. I've got things I've got to do. And I've actually, I pulled my kids together in a huddle at times. And I said, now listen. We can either stop at a convenience store or I could pack all the stuff and we don't have to stop. And then the inevitable question, well, what if I have to pee? <laughs> ah, we're still going to have to stop. <laughs> and you try to convince them, can't you just go in a bottle in the back? Like, you're trying to calculate all these things. Guys are just weird like, that. Can't, we just, can't we just keep rolling? And God says, no, I put your families in your life for a reason. So you'll take legitimate breaks. And so we're traveling. I don't know if you realize it. We're traveling with the Calvary family. Some of us are adrenaline junkies and some of us are not. Some of us love to just go and some of us are like pumping the brakes. Slow down, slow down, slow down. And so we, we've got to recognize that as we're traveling together We've got to take note of people that are pushing us forward, and we need to take note of people that are saying, Pastor, we need to slow down. We need to take a break. We need to legitimately rehuddle, reconfigure, and then get back in the game of life. Are you with me? And so as we do this together, there's two parts. If you look at the sermon title, it says, Get Out, Stretch. Um, these are, are, are two crucial parts. The words get out actually are an acronym of an action verb that I, I use all the time. Go. I say it to my kids. It's part of my normal vocabulary. Go, go, go. Whether I'm saying go as in let's go or go, get out of my face. You understand? It's a, it's a regular part of my vocabulary. Go, go, go. And what it means is, for me, it's that acronym, get out. There, that's a sense of who I am as a human being. I'm an action person. Let's get out of the huddle, and let's get out, and let's do something for the glory of God. I don't want to be one of those individuals found on the, the sidelines of life when God is calling us to action. So let's get back into the kayak, and we're, we're going down the river, and it's, it's, it's flowing pretty heavy. And we're rowing and we're, we're navigating through it. But you get a sense, I've got to get out of this flow. If I stay in this flow, my, my heart rate's going to be up way too high. My stress level's going to be way too high. If I don't make the conscious effort to get out of this flow and stretch, I'm going to get stuck. I'm going to get stuck in something that I can't compete with and it's going to overtake my life and it's going to be way too far down river before I can take a natural break. I need to get out. And what I mean by that is you're going to have to fight the current. You're going to have to go against the flow to get to the side where you can stretch. That is an action that many people don't want. They don't want to force themselves to get out of the flow, especially if the flow is going well for them, if they're making lots of money, if there's more overtime than ever has been available before. All of a sudden, hour upon hour, the flow is going good. I'm making a lot of money. But what's happening behind the scenes? Your life is falling apart. Your private life is falling apart. Everything is falling apart because the flow is so filled with energy. It's so filled with excitement. People are praising everything you're going. Move, 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 move. And you have to intentionally say, no! I got to steer this thing against the flow and force it to the sidelines. 
It doesn't feel like society wants you to do it. But I'm telling you that as we look to the scriptures today, everything within the mindset of God will tell you just when you think the flow is with you, it's time to get out and take a rest. The second part of this is stretching. Have any of you ever noticed how good stretching feels to your body? I don't know if any of you have uh, jobs behind the wheel of a car or uh, a truck or you're at a desk for many hours and, you know, these lovely smartwatches tell you, get up, it's time to stretch. You've been sitting too long. It's like, shut up, huh? I'm smart. I know what I'm doing. But the reality is many of us miss the opportunity because your clock, all it's doing is, is counting hours. You've been sitting for too long. It's time to stretch. And every once in a while, I'll look at it, I'll say, you're right. And I'll get up. Have you ever made that first step in your legs? Like, it feels like it weighs 700 pounds. Like, what is going on here? You know what your body is saying? It's time to stretch. Now, we're going to take these, these two occasions, getting out of the flow and stretching, and put that into the spiritual walk with God that he will call you in what seems to be momentous, occasional, uh, celebratory things in your life. And he says, all right, get out. What? No, yeah, I, I need you to get out. It seems unnatural. It doesn't seem like the thing to do, but I need you to get out. Well, what am I going to be doing over there? Stretching. And see, there, there's two parts of stretching. There are your own stretches. Have you ever stretched yourself? Anyone? I see your hands. You've stretched yourself. Now, how many of you have ever had a coach or someone else stretch you? How come their stretch is harder than yours? Like they push you and you're like, okay, okay. And they're like, no, no, no. You've got, we're going to lay your face flat. No, no, my body doesn't do that. Yes, it does. And they push you. And then they'll grab your leg and pull it longer than it's ever been stretched. You're like, I'm not Stretch Armstrong. Stop. I don't go that far. Oh, yes, you do. And when someone else stretches you, it's almost they know more what your body can do than you. See, you're gentle on yourself. You stretch, you're like, oh, ow, that's enough. Oh, ow, that's enough. And that's not what stretching is. Stretching is going to the length of your muscle to give it the full, how shall I say it, oxygen flow that your body needs so it will perform at the highest level possible. And not enough people stretch their physical body and not enough people stretch their spiritual body to know the limits of what you can actually do when you stop and stretch. I know from running, there are, there are the buildup of carbon dioxides in your body when you, when you push the physical stamina of your life, that if you don't stop and stretch those muscles, they will revolt on you, begin to hemorrhage on you, and have any of you ever had your muscles protest and begin to contort your body into all this pain and agony? I remember marathon, 21 miles in, I hit what was called the proverbial wall. My body was screaming at me. I didn't know what was happening. I thought I had trained. I thought I had read enough articles. I thought I had done enough. And I, I've, I know I've told this story before, this 70-year-old something's jogging past me. What's wrong with you, young man? I'm like, this isn't even fair. How, what's the secret, old man? Tell me. He says, your body is lacking electrolytes. Right there is a Gatorade station. Get as much Gatorade as you can. Restore the electrolytes. Get some water. And for God's sake, stretch and get back in the race. I could have either said, what does that old man know? Or you listen to experienced, advised individuals. I did exactly what he said. It was as if I had a brand new body. It was as if we were at mile one. I don't know what it was, but I took his advice, and here we are back in the race, taking off for the final uh, five miles. I thought, we can do this. We can finish this race. But without that, 
The medic tent is ready to receive you and put you on a stretcher and take you back to your family. How do you want to finish? On a stretcher or with your hands raised in victory? Here I am, Lord. I did it. I stopped at those particular moments in my life when I thought I didn't need to stop, but evidently I did. All the signs were there. I needed to stop, rest, stretch, and move forward. So I want to introduce you to a guy you know very well. His name is changed, actually, in Scripture, and we're going to follow his name change. His name is Simon, but we all know him as the great apostle Peter. And I, I kind of followed this in his nomenclature, and I thought, there's a story there. Where actually in the scriptures, it starts with the name Simon. Halfway through the passage, he's called Simon Peter. And then in the following passage later on, he's only called Peter. I thought, all right, there's got to be something there, Lord. You got to show me. You got to show me this guy's story. What did you do to him? And as I was praying, God says, I stretched him. I stretched him. I forced him in his overwhelming circumstances to stop him, to stretch him, and to move him forward. And when I did, I changed his name. I mean, he went from a guy named Simon to the rock. Simon to Peter, the rock on which God would build the foundation of his church. So I want to follow this guy with you. So if you'll turn in your Bibles to um, Luke chapter 5. We're going to pick it up in verse number 1, and we're going to follow this the stretching. We're going to meet an overwhelmed man, and we're going to stretch him with Jesus, and then we're going to watch him get a name change. So it was as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God that he stood by the lake of Genesaret and saw two boats standing by the lake, but the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats, which was, what's your Bible say? Simon's. All right, so we're meeting Simon. I need to stop for just a moment and before we pronounce him a disciple of Jesus Christ, I've got to tell you right here in the passage, he's not a follower of Jesus Christ yet. This is the pre-follower. This is the man who is just known as the fisherman, Simon. He has met Jesus before one chapter prior. Can I take you one chapter prior in your Bible to Luke chapter 4, verse 38? Now he arose from the synagogue and entered Simon's house. But Simon's wife's mother was sick with a high fever, and they made request of him concerning her. So he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her, and immediately she arose and served them. So wh wh why do I introduce these two stories? We have Simon the fisherman at work, and we have Simon at his home the chapter before who is really not a follower of Jesus Christ but he has experienced a miracle in his own home but it's not touched him it's touched his wife's mother his mother-in-law so you get a sense that all right there's there is Jesus and for anyone that has had a family member that know has known Jesus but you didn't know them yet they will often refer to things like, Simon, don't, don't you see the power of God? My mother, and, my mother was healed. Don't, don't you see the power of God was resident in our home to heal? And you see things with your own eyes, and you wonder in your own overwhelming circumstances, will Jesus touch me too? Have you ever wondered that when someone else gets a miracle, when someone else gets a touch, but you're in the middle of your own stress, you're in the middle of your own fishing business, you're in the middle of your own overwhelmed Simon life, and you wonder, when will God touch me? 
Someone else got a miracle. Someone else got a deliverance. Someone else is off drugs. Someone else is living the life that I want. Why do they get the miracle and I don't? And all of a sudden, Simon's back at work. It's so typical male. Well, I've got things to do. Your mother's good? Well, that's great. We're just going to forge on. I've got to go earn money. I've got to get a paycheck. And so back to Simon, the fisherman. He's washing his nets. The Lord Jesus needs a boat to preach from. And so he chooses Simon's boat and asks him to put it out a little bit from the land. And he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Now, doesn't, it, doesn't the passage just tell us that he was done fishing? Doesn't it say that he was washing his nets, putting them away, and the Lord says, can I use your boat? Yeah, I'm done. Go ahead. Use my boat. Go ahead. Preach from my boat all day long. In fact, I'm going to go take a nap over there while you preach. And all the men said, praise God. There's a reality of the moment here that says, I'm stressed out, I'm overwhelmed, I'm done. And then along comes Jesus and says, I'm done preaching now. Simon, I want you to get in your boat and launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a drag. Um, in that moment, can you feel Jesus stretching the man Simon? Simon. I don't know if, if God has ever put on you in the moment where you feel overwhelmed, where you feel like, you know what, I just had a fruitless night fishing. I didn't catch a thing. It's now daylight, and you want me, after you used my boat to preach, you now want me to go fishing. I'm tired. Have any of you ever told God, I don't feel like it, I don't want to, don't bother me, don't ask me? But he insists. The sense of a God that steps into your life says, no, I insist, I'm going to stretch you. I'm so glad you stopped fishing. I'm so glad that you're not fishing right now. I'm so glad that you're sitting on the sidelines resting. But now it's time to stretch you. Are you with me in the passage? Stop, get out, stretch or be stretched is a better way to say it. The Lord Jesus will stretch you. In moments. So let's see what Simon has to say. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. You feel the complaint rising off of him. Uh, Sir, I, I don't think you've understood. I'm overwhelmed. I'm tired. I'm stressed out. I pulled into the shores. I've already washed my nets. In fact, I did sit over here. I listened to your whole sermon, and I'm still awake. And now you want me to go back to work. I, I'm tired. I've toiled. I love that word. It's not, it's not the same as I worked all night. I toiled all night and caught Nothing. How many of you have worked an entire shift for nothing? I, I, I'm a fan of that um, entrepreneur television show called uh, Shark Tank. Have any of you ever watched it? And these people come up with very unique ideas. They'll pour all of their own personal income into it, and they will steal from their friends' incomes, and they're trying to get their business going. And then they, they finally get the questions from the sharks. All right, how many sales did you have last year? And then inevitably, if it's a good high number, they'll ask this question. And how much did you pay yourself? And a lot of them say, nothing. And the sharks are always taken aback. Like, you mean you've been working for the last two years? You've made millions of dollars for your company and you haven't been paid yet? That's what we call toiling for nothing. It's a big goose egg because productivity, paying all the people, paying for the price of everything that's got to be paid for. Once every, everybody gets paid, there's nothing left over, 
And that's why they're, they're begging for someone to team up with them that has the experience to say, maybe after I team up with you, I can finally get paid. And so that's where Simon's at. I'm really good at fishing. I promise you, normally when I go out, I catch all sorts of things. And Jesus says, oh yeah, how was your fishing last night? Zip. Now if that's your industry, if that's what you do for a living and you bring home nothing, both your wife and now your mother-in-law that feels better, look at you. Well, what do we got, Simon? What are we eating tonight? Nothing. Until the Savior steps into Simon's life and says, I know you don't feel like it. I know it feels overwhelming, but I'm about to stretch you. I'm about to do some physical, emotional, spiritual stretching, and I'm going to move you into a place where you don't think your body can go. But as I stretch you, there will be a renewed sense of oxygen flow in your system. And when it happens, you'll know it. Are you alive this morning? And so we follow Simon Peter in, or Simon in the passage. And he says these great words, Simon, in response to, to Jesus' request. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. Church, at some point, you may object, you may reject the the opportunity to stretch or be stretched by God. But at some point, you've got to put your yes to his request. You've got to say, yes, Lord, whatever it is that you demand. Nevertheless, whatever I said is, is no good. But what you say is good. I will let down my nets for the drag. Verse 6. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and their nets was breaking. Are are you alive? Are, are Are you in the passage with me? That suddenly when you're stretched beyond your own limits, and God is the one stretching you, saying, come on, I'm your... I'm your physical therapist right now. I, I, I say your muscles can do this. I say that if I stretch you, the, the result will be more than possible what you even dreamed. A God of the miraculous, a God of the incredible, certainly makes himself known that as he stretches, we put our obedience with his request, and all of a sudden, the, the human net, braided together with their human hands, cannot handle the catch of Almighty God. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. Let me speak to you for a moment about how your obedience will bless someone else, and they weren't even a part of the stretching. God, you mean you stretched me for them? Yes, I did. I filled your boat and their boat. And they weren't even a part of the spiritual moment. How is that fair? It's not, okay? The fairness doctrine is not in Scripture. Get over the fact God does not operate in fair. But he does operate in obedience. And he somehow has the ability to fill your boat and the boat of someone next to you. And they are all questioning, what happened here, Simon? Do tell us what what happened here that both your boat and our boat is filled, but last night we couldn't catch a thing. Do, do tell. And when you've been stretched by the Almighty, there is always a testimony on the other side. If you miss the opportunity to testify, you miss the idea of why we overcome. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. Look what the Lord has done. Look how he filled both your boat and mine. And it was your obedience. It was your humility. It was your exhaustion. It was your overwhelming zero that God says, all right, are you ready to stretch? Are you ready to get out of your zone and into my zone? And when you're in my zone, I can stretch you beyond the normal limits. And here comes the vast supply. It 
It says that, and they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. Don't you love the abundance that creates a problem? <laughs> oh, Lord, they're, they're, it's too much. It's too much. It, it makes me think back to the offering back when the, the, uh, the followers, along with Moses, were taking an offering. And Moses says, no, 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 enough. I need to restrain the giving. We have more than enough to accomplish the task that God has ordained. I'll tell you, I've been pastoring a long time. I've never restrained the offering. <laughs> I've always said, let's take another one. I look out at Marsha. Yep, take another one. Pastor, take, take three. Take three offerings. Because there, there's a sense that I think we think that if we, if we walk in faith, if we walk in blessing, it's going to create a problem. And it might. Look at the abundance that they have. Now their boats are sinking. It creates a whole new sense of energy. Move the boats quickly. We've got to get them to shore. We've got to get these fish out. We've got way too much. And, you know, we're, we're talking pre-refrigeration. We're talking pre-electric. I mean, they've got a real problem on their hand. They've got to get these boats out of the water. They've got to get them to the market. They've got to move quickly. And there's a sense that you can't move quickly until you've been stretched. Otherwise, all you're left with is stressed and overwhelmed, and I'm too tired, and I can't move that. But if God will stretch you and give you the, the oxygenated muscles that you need to move, you can handle both the problem and the true blessing that are happening at the same time. Say it a better way. Uh, Tammy and I came into this church and the school system here, and the school was bankrupt. And I don't mean that kiddingly. It was bankrupt. We owed money more than what was coming in. That's the definition of bankruptcy. And so you start to put the natural steps together. You start to grow a business. But, you know, when you grow a business, you have to hire people and all. Do I need to say anything else? <laughs> because when it's only a handful of people, you can control it pretty good. But you start to get outside of 10, 12, 15. You start to get into double digits. You get all kind of personalities in the room. And all of a sudden, you're like, um, what are you doing? Do your job. But over here, the bank account has never seen so much money. Over here, you've got customers lining up. And over here, I've got problems. Amen? Yeah. Do you understand? With the blessing comes problems, and God says, guess what you need? You need stretched one more time, because you couldn't handle it before, and you can't handle it now, and the only way we can do it is to put you through the spiritual stretch. From stress to stretch to blessing to more problems, welcome to the planet, everyone. It never goes away. It just increases in size, and so must your faith rise to new levels. I don't think anybody wants to hear this sermon. <laughs> Verse 8. When Simon Peter saw it, all of it, the blessing, the problem, look what Simon does, and notice his name change right here. From Simon to what? Simon Peter. So if I could, he shares a duality. I've got one foot into, all right, I'm Simon. But I've got one foot into, I think I trust this guy, Jesus. And we start to see the quivering between two worlds. And Simon Peter, this is what I think is the, the clear change, saw it. He fell down at Jesus' knees saying, depart from me. For I am a sinful man, O oh Lord. That's, that hardly seems like the right answer. But what does Simon, turning into Peter, what is he feeling at this moment? I'm just a scumbag. I'm just a regular dude. I don't deserve this kind of blessing in my life. Get away from me. I'm a sinful man. Don't you understand? I'm Simon. And Jesus is looking at him, no, you're, you're more like Simon Peter. 
I just need to stretch you a little bit more and a little bit more so that we don't have to call you Simon anymore. We will only eventually call you Peter. So we're in the middle of a, a stretch. We're in the middle of a moment here in which I think complete humility is being displayed. God, I am undeserving. How many of you ever feel that way with God? My reputation preceding this moment is nothing but garbage. God, why would you do this? And I see it all the time. Why, why do I deserve this blessing? And the answer is clear. You don't. That's why it's called grace. You don't deserve this blessing. There is none righteous. No, not one. Everyone's past is despicable. There is no one that can come to the place where, where Simon is and say, oh, yes, I deserve this kind of catch. I should be fishing like this all the time. No one comes to the incredible moment of grace and says, of course. It's clear why Jesus chose me. We should come to this grappling moment that says, God, why are you being so nice to me? Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Listen to it. Because he first loved me. I've known that song probably since I was early days in church, one, two years old when you start to hear church me. I've known that song my whole life. But the theological grip that I can't love him until I know he loved me first. That he is not looking at my reputation. He's not looking at all the things I've done. He knows all of that. And in spite of it, he still loves you and pours out his grace and says, look what I can do with just a simple, obedient heart that looks at the circumstances and said, there's no way this can happen. Nevertheless, at your will, I will do it. And does it and sees the response. And he's further humiliated and says, God, please just leave me alone. I don't deserve such blessing. And it's this moment it's at this moment that his name begins to shift from just Simon to now it's Simon Peter. He's partly flesh. He's partly rock. But shall I say, he's making the transition. What about you? Most of us like to just stay jelly. No, I'm just, I'm just jelly. And God says, yeah, but I want you to be a rock. Yeah, but I, I just, I, I can't do that, Lord. I know you can't. But let me stretch you, and let's see what the results will be when I stretch you. Verse 9. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish which they had taken. And also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. What? The whole thing was a setup. It wasn't even about fish, was it? Simon, I'm changing you from a fisherman to a man catcher. I'm, I'm changing you from one who simply pulls fish out of the water to someone who will pull men out of their sin. Don't, don't you see? I'm making a real man out of you. I'm making a real human being out of you. All you've known your whole life is business, following in your father's footsteps to make a business. And listen, dude, by yourself, you're not even good at it. The only day you're good at it is when I help you. And it's the same way spiritually. None of us are good at working for God until we are obedient and he starts to shift us from Simon to Simon Peter. We become astonished by God. He does it with everyone. Moses is out in the middle of the wilderness minding his own business and he, a fire catches his eyes. God, well, what's this? And he goes to check it out and as, it checks, as he's checking out the bush, the bush talks to him. 
Moses, Moses, the ground on which you stand is holy ground. Take off your shoes. Hey, if the bush says so, take off your shoes. <laughs> You're on holy ground. You're about to move out of human capacity into spiritual capacity. But if you don't do the silly operations in between, you're going to miss a move of God in your own life. They are designed to stretch you, designed to take you from your normal stretching to, oh, my neck doesn't do that. Yes, it does. My wife and I go to a chiropractor every Wednesday, and she does stuff to us that our body can't handle. No, it doesn't do that. Yes, it does. All right, get back to work. I think I'm still alive. It all still works. Okay. And you go to work, and there's something about all of that activity that stretches you and makes you do what you wouldn't normally do. Because here's what happens when our bodies are pained, we protect it. That's why people limp instead of walk. They're, they're protecting it, right? Oh, that hurts. Oh, that hurts. Or this one. You ever see this walk? Oh, God. Or how about this walk? Oh, God. Like, we've got them all down pat. We protect ourselves instead of stretch ourselves. And God would say, if you would just stretch, if you would just get out and stretch, you could actually get back in there and do abundantly above more than you ever hoped or imagined possible. But if you don't stop, it will break you and you will die and you will be useless to me on the planet. Does that preach well? It doesn't sound like it. From now on, you will catch men. S scholars would call this his calling. He was called into the ministry. One who was just known a passage ago in, in, in Luke chapter 4 is someone who just casually knew Jesus, and Jesus stopped by the house and healed your mother-in-law. Now in the next pa passage... Simon is getting his own miracle, and furthermore, the call of God on his life to do something that he's never done before, evangelize the world for Jesus Christ. If we follow this man, Peter, later on you'll find him in the book of Acts. It's called the Acts of the Disciples. That's the actual name of the book. You will find that as, as he's walking through a region, his shadow is falling on people, and they're being healed. How do you get that guy out of this guy? Unless God gets a hold of him and says, I know you're stressed. I know you're overwhelmed, but I didn't make you for that. I made you for this. Since before the foundations of the world, I made you to catch men for God, not to catch fish for food. And in these moments, you feel a bit fleshy, but you have sparks of revival in your own heart, and you feel very Peter-esque. And then you leave that moment, and you feel very Simon-esque. And you, you wonder, what, what, what am I becoming? What am I doing? Am I Simon, or am I Peter? And the answer to that is yes. Right now, you are Simon, Peter. I really want to just call you Peter, but right now, all I've got is Simon, Peter. And I feel like that's a name that's on top of the church right now. It, it's, it has moments in which we're like, yes, the presence of God was at Calvary. The prayer was powerful. People were healed. And then next week, it's very Simon. And Simon Peter fits our church right now. But I want to encourage us. Can we be stretched a little bit further to say, what is the call of God on Calvary? I believe it's that he wants to call us Peter. That we not vacillate between two opinions. That we not go back and forth, danced about by the wind. Let not that man expect that he'll receive anything from God. So as we move out of vacillating into the clear call of God on this church to evangelize the region, to see miracles, signs, and wonders follow us who believe, there is a moment where we've got to stop in the flow of our own lives and say, all right, God, what is it that you wanted to do? I wanted to stretch you. 
and I, th- I think I can say this and still be biblical. There's a moment where he has to stretch you, and then there's a moment when you know it's time to stop and stretch. I'm experienced enough to know where I'm at right now. This is a moment where I get out and stretch. I need the miracle provision of God. I need him to speak to me again. I need to stretch. So let's go now to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew's uh, speaking of this same man, uh, Simon, and telling us the story of how he moves from being stretched from Simon to Simon Peter to now the renewed man, Peter. It's Matthew 16, starting in verse number 13. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I am, the Son of Man? So they said, Some say you're John the Baptist, some say Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But he said to them, Who do you say that I am? Now I love it because someone's about to speak. And he's Simon, and he's Peter. Someone is about to speak. He's fleshy in the Simon-esque of it all, but he's Peter-esque, and he's about to speak by faith. Because the popularity of Jesus will will cause all of this. What what is the popular movement in the region? What, What do they say here in Caesarea Philippi? Who do they say I am? Oh, that's easy. You're John the Baptist. You're... Jeremiah, you're one of the prophets, Elijah. You're you're one of the old guys raised from the dead, standing here in our midst, declaring the glory of God. Isn't that who you are? And Jesus doesn't even acknowledge the popular opinion. That should say something loud and clear in this room. How can I? Jesus doesn't watch the news to find out what's going on. Does not care about popular opinion does not care what society is doing as a whole. He doesn't care. He just wants to know, who do you say I am? Who do you, in the moment of your flesh and in the moment of your own revival, in your moment of being Simon, in your moment of feeling very Peter-esque, who do you say that I am? And I don't know what happened to the rest of the disciples in this moment. I imagine, you know... uh, Sitting in a classroom, have you ever sat in a classroom and the teachers, you know they're speaking English up there, but they, you don't know what they're saying. <laughs> and they ask a question and they'll say, uh, all right, Scott, can you tell me what the square root of 64 is? And you're like, what? <laughs> don't pick me. And so when you don't want to be called on, what do you do? Mm-hmm. Like, just, just, just stare at your paper. Just stare, because if you don't look the teacher in their eye, they won't call on you. Like, I imagine that's what's happening in this passage. Jesus says the word, all right, who do you say that I am? And everybody looks down. (laughs) Oh, don't pick me. Don't, don't, don't. But one guy is not looking at his feet. One guy has his eyes fastened on Jesus. Jesus. And in a moment where he's not Simon and he's not Peter yet, but he's having a Peter-esque moment. I know who you are. Have any of you ever had revelation? I mean, it wasn't man. It wasn't a preacher. It wasn't a songwriter. It was God. He's speaking and you know it. No one else can get credit for it. That's what's happening here. Everyone else is looking at their sandaled feet for the answer. And Peter's squarely looking Jesus in the eye. I know who you are. So let's read it. Verse 15, he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter. Did you feel it? 
Do you feel the shift? Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. And that's a whole different sermon that I'd love to preach to you someday. Simon, son of Jonah. But, but I no longer call you Simon, the son of a man. I call you Peter. Why? Why? Why is he calling him Petros, the rock? Why is he giving him this nomenclature? I will call you Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. I don't, somehow this guy, Peter, is not standing on the seashores groveling for fish anymore, is he? I know who you are. You're the son of the living God. You're the Christ. I know who you are. I, I wonder what the rest of the group thought. Oh, man, Peter's dead. Or Simon is dead, I should say. Simon's dead. He's out. He was in the club, but now he's definitely out of the club. I mean, this is a miracle worker. He's probably John the Baptist raised from the dead. That's, who, that's probably who this guy is. He's probably one of the uh, Old Testament prophets. If not John the Baptist or Elijah, it's got to be Jeremiah. It's got to be one of the old standbys. I think they want to believe the crowd. But when Peter says, thou art the Christ... It makes a new declaration. It calls Jesus the Son of God, which is blasphemy if he's not. So you're waiting for the correction from their rabbi. You're waiting for Jesus to say, wrong, Peter, and slap him. Beat him down, telling, telling him he's a failure one more time, but he doesn't. He says, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for this has not been revealed to you by man. This has come from the lips of God to your ears. You now understand. And because you understand, on this foundation I will build my church. You're in church this morning because a man was willing to be changed from fleshy Simon to a rock that's willing to declare what is unpopular. This is Messiah. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Go ahead and preach this in the world of duplicity and find out if they love you or hate you. He preaches the exclusivity of Christ. And it, it creates clear lines of demarcation. Is he a heretic or is he a man of God? And Jesus says, you're a man of God. And I will build my church on such declarations. Furthermore, Peter, I'm going to give you the secrets the keys that will open doors that whatever you open or lock here on earth will be open or locked in the heavenly realm. I mean, such power. Peter, don't you understand that you're going to run up against somebody who will, who will come up to you begging for silver and gold and you're going to have the keys to the kingdom of God and you're going to unlock them from their handicap. And when you loose them here on earth, I will agree with you and loose them into the heavenly realm. All right, do, you, do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, yes. Peter and John head up to the, the temple just about the hour of prayer. And here is a man begging. He cannot walk since birth. Looking at Peter and John, hoping for money. Peter says to him, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he went running and leaping and praising God. Amen. You see, what is given to the man that walks by faith is renewed strength to operate by the power of a holy God that says, heaven agrees with you, Peter. Just keep making the right declarations by faith. Hear from God, speak what he says, and the world around you will be ultimately changed. Or we can just have regular old church. Oh, pastor, don't stretch me too much. That hurts. 
Pastor, why you got to preach like that? I feel bad. I, I, my first sermon was preached in Noonan, Georgia. I was an intern. The pastor, for whatever reason, gave me a microphone. And uh, you know me by now. I'm an enthusiastic, preach this word in your face kind of guy. Out of that sermon, and it was, it was a, I don't know how to say it, it was a very well-to-do um, congregation. One of the, the very large givers in the church pulled the pastor aside and said, don't let that guy speak anymore. He hurts my feelings. <laughs> and the pastor told me, he's like, maybe you want to take that edge off your preaching. Forget you, no way. Don't you see what that does to a man? It takes him from Simon to Peter. You see, if you don't somehow get in their face and show them God and the power of his word and what you can become, oh, don't, 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 that hurts, Pastor. You... Sorry, I'm going to stretch you. If you're living a sinful life, I want you to meet Jesus. If you're living a mediocre Jesus life, I want you to meet the Holy Spirit. If you met the Holy Spirit, I want you to get in a, a boat with Jesus in a storm. Do you understand? I, I'm always going to... Let's go. Let's go. Let's do one more thing for God. He's coming soon. Do one more thing for the glory of God. Stretch. Amen. And then we'll get going. We'll get going. You'll say, Pastor, isn't it awesome? Yeah, let's pull off and stretch. <laughs> We've got one more day. One more day. Let's stretch again. And let's go for greater heights. And we'll go for greater heights. And we'll build bigger buildings. And more people will get saved. More people will be filled with the Holy Spirit. And you'll say, isn't it great, Pastor? I'll say, no. Let's stop and stretch. Let's let God stretch us one more. Because even three stories of, of people filled with the Holy Spirit isn't enough in a town of hundreds of thousands of people who don't know Jesus Christ. We can have the fastest record of growth in the assemblies or in, in the world, but it won't matter if we're not hitting the line of where crime is and where prostitution is and where drug addiction is. If we're not changing the baseline, what are we doing? We just have people coming to church, but are we stretched for the glory of God? So I don't, I don't know where you're at. Maybe you're, you're just Simon. Maybe you're in the middle of feeling Simon, and you've got moments, you've got glimpses of Peter in your life, and you're like, yeah, I'm good. And Jesus says, well, not really. I, I need you to be Peter, see, because I can only really move in, in, in the, the proclamations of a Peter. So if you can see that the end of this from the beginning, that God wants to keep us propelled, keep us moving, but it's through channels of rest and stretch. Keep moving. Rest and stretch. Keep moving. Rest and stretch and keep moving for the glory of God. Would you stand with me? I just want to ask in this room, you know, um, in the language of the sermon, whether you're just Simon or Simon Peter, if you're ready to move to a Peter-esque life, would you lift your hand and say, yeah, Pastor, you're talking to me. I just, I don't want to be normal. I don't want to be ordinary. I want to see it. I want to hear it. I want to respond to it. Amen. All over. Would you put your other up, hand up in heaven as a surrender to say, all right, God, you got me. You got me right where you want me. Heavenly Father, See our surrender in this room. See our desire, Lord, to not just settle for the common flow of what's going on. But we would take the clear advantage fighting the flow of what's going on and parking, resting, being stretched by you for the ultimate change in ourselves to be the people of God in a generation that have somehow learned the secret of being called away with you, by you, for you. That your anointing would be upon us and it would be clear 
by the words we speak, the choices that we make, that we are men and women of God in our generation, called according to your purpose to live a life that makes sense in light of eternity. That when we come to the end of our lives and we stand before you in your presence, that we will hear these words. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy I provided. Father, to that end, I pray that you would empower us by your spirit to live extraordinary lives. And Father, we ask this accomplished in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen.